I've titled today's sermon, An Explanation of the Law. Today, by God's grace, we're going to continue our sermon series in Paul's epistle to the Romans. We are currently in chapter 7. In today's sermon, I'm going to be addressing verse 7 through 13. Once again, I've titled today's sermon, An Examination of the Law. Before I address the law, let me just state this for a moment. In the present culture, we have to be reminded about many of the idols that many professing Christians have fashioned and have cultivated. Today, many people today believe in a doctrine called free will. And the moment you tell them free will is fiction, free will is a myth, Free will is a lie. They're going to become upset with you. They're going to say, how can you say free will is a myth and a lie if clearly right now I am freely choosing to speak to you? That proves free will is true. And I argue with them. No, it doesn't. The fact that you think you have free will by speaking to anybody right now is Not proof that you have free will, it's proof that you are speaking contemptuously against the God of the Bible who works all things after the counsel of his will. Another idol that men have cultivated is the very popular belief that God loves everybody, Jesus died for everybody. I promise you right now, Everywhere you go, you're going to find this will be an issue with everybody you evangelize, even probably with the vast majority of your family members. It will be that way if you talk to someone in a grocery store, and it'll definitely be that way if you talk to your neighbors. They're going to look at you like a cult leader, like how could you possibly say Jesus doesn't love everybody. And how can you possibly say he didn't die for everybody? And your response should be very simple. I can easily say that because that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God loves the elect. You see in Romans how the Holy Spirit is poured out into the hearts of God's people. We see in the Gospel of John how Christ died for the sheep. And then he told the false teachers, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. Therefore, Christ didn't die for all men. You have to show them these Bible verses with love, but also with boldness. Sadly, today, what you'll find is that many people, instead of being bold, instead of being loving by telling people the truth, they'll compromise by trying to find neutrality with someone. Okay, okay, that's what you believe, and this is what I believe, but you know, we can meet in the middle. No, we don't meet in the middle with anybody. There is no neutrality. Didn't Christ make it clear? He talked about the the unwise man, the foolish man who built his house on sand and the rains fell and the floods came and, and it knocked it down and it was destroyed. But the wise man who builds his house on on that solid foundation. The rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew, but yet it still stood because it had a strong foundation. We stand firm on the foundation of the word of God and it is scripture alone uh, in that we say here we stand. So when I say all this, it's important that we're always reminded about what the message of the New Testament says to destroy arguments and all lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. So we have to destroy these arguments. We have to make it clear to them that apart from Christ, you have nothing, because that's literally what Christ said. Christ said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And Christ also made it clear, with men, things are impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. So we have to be able to theologically and spiritually destroy these idols that people affirm. Now, hearing about people having idols as doctrines is nothing new. 
If you go back to the Old Testament, remember in Exodus 32? Moses was in the mountain and the people noticed he was afar off. So what most deviant people will do when the minister is afar, they will gather together and they wanted to start worshiping false gods. It was said to the people, get your children and your wives earrings that were made of gold and give them all here. And they took those gold earrings, they melted them down and basically formed a calf. And these people were so wicked. They made offerings to it. They worshiped it. They said, here is your God that brought you up out of Egypt. <clears throat> they were singing, they were dancing. And Moses afar off was speaking to the Lord and the Lord told Moses. Jehovah told Moses that these stiff-necked people who we, I delivered out of their bondage, they have turned against me. They have worshiped a golden calf. And he said, leave them alone and I will bring them to nothing and utterly destroy them. God was going to trample them with wrathful rebukes. But then, of course, we know in the Bible how the Bible speaks of Moses's intercession. And then Moses went down to the people and saw what had happened. Moses immediately took those tablets, smashed them down. He took that golden calf and he had threw it in the fire, burned it into powder, took that powder, tossed it into the water and made these idolatrous will worshipers drink it. And that is today what needs to take place spiritually. We need to take those idols that people affirm. We need to toss them into the fire where it burns the powder, toss it in the, into the waters and let the people drink it. Ladies and gentlemen, today I want to get into a study into an examination of the law. Since I um, just mentioned the law very briefly and the idols that people worship, I want to draw your attention now into the message of Romans chapter 7. Last week I addressed verse 1 through 6 and I touched on some key points. In today's sermon I'm going to address verse 8 through th I'm sorry, verse 7 through 13 and again I've titled my sermon an examination of the law. Let me draw your attention now to Romans 7, verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 7 through 13. Would you follow along with the reading of the Lord's word? And then I'll pray. I'll ask you to keep your Bible open. And then I'll provide commentary over these few verses. Romans 7 starting at verse seven says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made unto death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Keep your Bible open and let's pray, and then I will provide commentary by God's grace on these few texts. Let's pray. 
Lord Almighty, we know the law could never save. We know the law can never provide us with assurance of salvation. We know no sinner could ever perfectly keep the law. And we know no sinner should ever try to quantify their law keeping. Lord, we know the law has a purpose. For by the law comes the knowledge of sin. And we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. I pray today that I will provide a concise explanation of thy law. And I pray it will be in accordance with thy word by the Spirit's empowerment and illumination over me. In Christ's name I pray, amen. When you're reading Romans 7, many people could become vexed over reading Romans 7, and I'll tell you why. Because if you look at the very beginning of Romans 7, how it talks about being dead to the law, being freed from the law, but then when you start getting into the verses that are subsequent to those two that I mentioned a minute ago, you'll see how Paul starts to say that the law is holy, just, and good. He said he delighted in the law. So many people could easily become perplexed over reading Romans 7. Well, give us an explanation of what this means, many could easily say. Well, let me just state this really quickly here. First of all, in the previous verses in Romans 7, when Paul said we were dead to the law and that we were freed from the law, what he's simply stating biblically is that Christ redeemed God's particular people from the bondage, curse, and the condemnation of the law. So they are no longer under the law, but under grace. They are no longer married to the law of Moses, but to the master and Lord, Christ Jesus. As I now get into the first verse in today's sermon, particularly verse 7, Paul in this verse is actually providing his experience with the law pre-conversion. So let me draw your attention now and let's read verse 7 through 8 and then I'll provide commentary. Romans 7, starting at verse 7 through 8. Paul said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law... For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. Regarding these two verses, Paul mentions in verse 7, Is the law sin? God forbid. Well, listen to me when I say this. People get confused because they're reading the previous verses where it says we're dead to the law and we're freed from the law. So, of course, Paul asks this question and he responds because he's helping to overcome objections. He is actually providing clarification. Ladies and gentlemen, the law is not sin. Men are sinners. The law is not evil. Men are evil. The law is not the fault. Men are the fault. So that's why Paul asked this question and answer response, again, which is nothing new in Paul's writings. If you pay careful attention to detail to all the previous sermons that I have preached on in all the other chapters of Romans 1 through 6, you'll note that this question-answer approach is typical of Paul's style of writing, not just in Romans, but also in other epistles that he has written. For example, in Romans 7, 7, notice how Paul asks the question, and then he says, God forbid. Specifically, Paul says, is the law sin? God forbid. This is very similar to what he did in Galatians 3, 21. When the apostle said, does the law affect the promises of God? God forbid. That's typical of how Paul style of writing. When Paul said God forbid, this is basically his way of saying that 
he abhors or stands against that which is contrary to the teachings of the word of God. So please understand this is, this is nothing new in Paul's style of writing. I know you, if you look back into Romans and Paul said, God forbid that God be true and every man a liar. Now you know why Paul says, God forbid, and he says it on multiple occasions. When Paul says in Romans 7, 7, for by the law comes the knowledge of sin, we see one of the uses of the law. Believe it or not, this is very similar to Romans 3.20 when it says, for by the law comes the knowledge of sin. <clears throat> Additionally, when Paul says that by the law comes the knowledge of sin, or I have not known sin except by the law, what Paul is simply reminding his readers of is that they are sinners. This is nothing new and that they break the law. If you look to, I believe it's 1 John 3, 4. The Bible says, whoever committeth sin transgresseth the law for sin is a transgression of the law. There's an easy definition for what sin is. Again, 1 John 3, 4, whoever committeth sin transgresseth the law for sin is a transgression of the law of the law. In Romans 7, you'll note that Paul repeatedly talks about the law and he even in the subsequent verses of where I'm at right now says that the law is good, holy, and just and even says that he delights in the law. This is nothing new if you go to Psalm 119. The psalmist actually says, oh Lord, I love your law. As a result of these texts, please understand, like most of the things that God has given us in his word, false teachers will grossly pervert them. You have to be mindful of that. For example, a legalist will take texts like Romans 7, all the mentions of that the law is holy, just, and good, and Paul delights on the law, and they'll take the text in the Psalms where it says, oh Lord, I love your law, and they'll argue that the law is a means of salvation, or they will argue that the law can save, or they will argue most popularly that the law or their keeping of the law provides assurance of salvation. And I argue these views are heresy. And I'll explain to you why. Clearly, Paul's talking about the law in verse seven. But let me tell you why arguing that the law is a means of salvation is heresy. First of all, understand this easy and simple to understand disclaimer. The law cannot and will never save one soul from hell. According to scripture, people that rely on the works of the law are under a curse unless God delivers them. Now you'll see why Paul in Romans 3, 28 actually said this. For we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Most popularly, false teachers believe that law-keeping provides assurance of salvation, and that is equally disturbing as the aforementioned argument I just mentioned. And I'll tell you why. First of all, the law cannot provide assurance of salvation because the law doesn't save. As I've stated in many, many sermons, people who broach such the, an idea are contradicting themselves. Because they're basically teaching this. My assurance of salvation is in my law keeping which doesn't save. You see how that's contradicting? It sounds imbecilic. It is self-refuting. You don't trust in something for assurance that can never save. Remember this easy to understand disclaimer that I'm about to share with you. The ground of justification which is Christ Jesus and his perfect righteousness, 
guarantees assurance of salvation. Therefore, assurance of salvation is only because of the ground of justification. Therefore, if you're looking for evidence of salvation, look only to the merits of Christ alone, excluding works and law keeping. Additionally, it's futile to make the argument that the law can provide assurance of salvation because the Bible says, according to James 2.10, if you break one, you break them all. So people who look to biblical texts where it says, if anyone has no love for Christ, let it be anathema. And they say, well, see, I love Jesus. Therefore, I know I have assurance. Well, how do you know that you can justify that argument if the Bible says you break one, you break them all? See the danger of trusting in yourself. If you trust in yourself, you'll have nothing but contradiction. Because while you're looking to yourself, the Bible says, you break one, you break them all. But if you look to Christ alone and understand that it is his vicarious law keeping and his particular death that was imputed to the account of his elect, and that is their righteousness, whereby they will stand before the throne of grace and they will guaranteed enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not because of something they did, but because of the completed and saving work of Christ alone. So that's why I tell people, stop looking to yourself, look to the imputation of Christ because Christ alone provides assurance of salvation. Today, many people, when they examine the law, they madly think that they can quantify their law keeping and some today even go so far as to argue that they stop sinning. Again, I think this is ridiculous. You can't quantify your law keeping because it is God who ordained all things whatsoever shall come to pass. It is God who wills and works in you according to his good pleasure. So you can't quantify that which God has sovereignly ordained in eternity. You have to trust in the sovereignty of God if you are truly one of God's elect. Additionally, some people today think that when they become saved, they stop sinning. That's ridiculous. According to the Bible, the word of God says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands God, none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They all have become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. God's word also tells us in uh, 1 John 1 eight, if we say we have no sin, we deceived ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Therefore, after God declares the elect to be righteous because of Christ alone, the saints of God are no longer under the law. They are under grace. They are no longer married to Moses. They're married to the master, Christ Jesus. I tell you all this because as we read the Bible, please understand I despise legalism and you should as well. And I shared with you several reasons why you should stand strongly against legalism, but you should also despise equally the heresy of antinomianism. Now, the reason why, because if you pay careful attention to Romans 7, verse 7, it's a problem passage for antinomians because an antinomian will do their best to try to divorce the Ten Commandments of the moral law from the New Testament, but Paul doesn't. Paul doesn't. Look what Paul says in Romans 7, verse 7. Paul said, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. What do you think Paul is referring here to? Thou shalt not covet. Paul is not divorcing the Ten Commandments from the New Testament. Paul is simply reaffirming them. What do you think thou shalt not covet come from? It's the 10th commandment. Literally, Paul here is referring to Exodus 20, verse 17, which literally says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or thy neighbor's wife or thy maidservant, thy manservant, or thy ox or donkey or anything that belongs to thy neighbor. 
So clearly, Paul is alluding to or citing directly from the 10th commandment. So let me give you this quick disclaimer real quick because I need to provide you guys several reasons why Paul citing or alluding to the Ten Commandments needs to be explained. Because again, while I provided an overview of how to defend the Bible against the legalists, I also want to show you guys how to defend the Bible against the antinomians. Again, legalism... They basically abuse the law because they believe that the law could save. An antinomian treats the law with disdain and they're imprudent with it. They're reckless. But there is a biblical way to treat the law. If you remember what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1, the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. So remember this quick disclaimer about to share with you. The law can never save The law can never provide you with assurance. God's elect are no longer under the law. They're under grace. God's elect are not married to the law of Moses. They're married to the master and Lord. God's elect, they are not able to stop sinning and they should never try to quantify their law keeping. So I've given you these important disclaimers to let you know where I stand with the law, but now it's important to explain to you how to treat the law biblically. For a reference, I actually read through a scholar named by the name of Dr. Hicks. He provides uh, an explanation on the distinction of the laws, which again, I'll interact with in today's uh, sermon. While I don't agree with everything this theologian says, there are some points he makes that are very helpful. So let me explain to you today, very briefly, when Paul mentions, thou shall not covet, in Romans 7, verse 7, Paul, again, is is alluding to or directly citing from the 10th commandment. So I want to explain to you right now on why, if you examine the laws, how they are distinct. So, for example, you have the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. I argue that they're distinct and they're not referring to the same. Listen to the exegesis that I'm about to provide. I'll share contextual arguments. I'll share theological arguments and exegetical arguments as well. Here's how I know that the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial laws are distinct and not the same. If you examine the Bible, any Christian can show you texts where Moses, under the inspiration of the Spirit, wrote the civil and the ceremonial laws. But clearly, the moral law of the Ten Commandments are distinct from that, because guess who wrote the Ten Commandments or the moral law? According to Exodus 31, the Bible says it was literally written by the finger of God. I say it again, quote, finger of God, end quote, So you clearly see there is a distinction here between the laws. The civil and the ceremonial, it doesn't say that it was written by the finger of God. Moses wrote it under the inspiration of the Spirit. Additionally, Christians can easily show you several texts of the Bible where Moses gave the civil and the ceremonial laws to the people. But guess who gave the Ten Commandments to the people? It was God himself, and it was given in a very unique way, unlike all the other laws. If you examine Exodus 19, it literally says there were thunder, thick clouds, lightnings, and there was a sound of a loud trumpet. And then it literally says that the people would tremble. You see clearly how The the moral law, the Ten Commandments, were given with authority. And it was clearly given in a very unique way. Another way that you know that the laws are distinct, look at the Ark of the Covenant. Here's a question I have for you all. Were the civil and the ceremonial laws inside of the Ark of the Covenant? No, they were not. They were outside of the Ark of the Covenant. Guess what was inside of the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. This right here 
provides justification to see why the moral law was so significant and why it was distinct from the other laws. That's important. Now, for exegetical purposes, I need to share with you exegesis so you can see with your own eyes, once you examine the word of God, remember, I believe in the priesthood of all believers. So you have to be able to read the Bible, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will open your eyes to see these truths I'm about to share with you, to see how the laws are distinct. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, I believe it's verse 13 through 14, where the Bible says that he declared unto you the covenant, which he commanded you to perform. And the Lord God commanded him to teach the, and then he says, even the Ten Commandments, which were written on the tablets of stone, for God commanded him to teach the statutes and the judgments. So if you examine Deuteronomy 4, 13 through 14, you'll see that commandments are mentioned first and then are subsequently followed by the statutes and the judgments. So again, you have commandments, statutes, and judgments. Guess what? When you examine these words in the context, you'll find they are not exegetically the same. They are not linguistically identical. And per the context, they don't have the same categorical or semantical idea. They don't. They simply don't. If you want further exegesis, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, just a couple chapters later, at the very beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Bible literally mentions about teaching the commandments. In Hebrew, it's the word mitzvah. Then it says the statutes. That's the Hebrew word hok. And then you have the judgments, mishpat. So when you examine these three Hebrew words, Commandments, statutes, and judgments. Commandments, again, is mitzvah. You have hok, and then you have mishpat. When you examine these three words, for example, if you look at the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, take a look at just the word for commandments, mitzvah. You'll see it literally refers to code of law. That's code of law. Then if you take a look at the statutes, hok, You'll see that it literally refers to enactments or ordinances. And then if you examine judgments, the word mitzpat or mishpat, you'll see that it literally refers to um, ex execution of rulings. So again, commandments, statutes, and judgments, they are not exegetically the same. They are not linguistically identical. And per the context, they do not have the same categorical or semantical idea. They simply do not. And people that disagree are simply ignoring the exegesis. Again, because I'm focusing on the context. This is very important that you remember this. Additionally, it's also ridiculous today for certain people because, again, Romans 7, verse 7, Paul says, Thou shall not covet. Clearly, he's referring to one of the Ten Commandments. But again, there are some people today who just can't stand the fact that someone would even broach the idea that Paul would mention one of the Ten Commandments because many people today believe the Ten Commandments were abrogated. Well, here's the problem with that line of reasoning. The moral law of God clearly could not have been abrogated because it is the moral law of God that was written on the hearts of the Gentiles. The works of the law was written on their hearts. For example, if you take a look at Romans 2, and let me share with you some exegesis on this. In Romans 2, verse 14 through 15, it says, For the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. They show that they are law to themselves. For they have the work of the law written in their hearts, even though they do not have the law. So clearly in the context, Paul describes the works of the law that were indelibly engraved in the heart of the Gentiles. But the question or the debate remains, what law is the works of the law that is written in their hearts? 
Now, some people today will argue it has nothing to do with the moral law and they'll fight to death on that. But the problem is they're going to have to blatantly ignore the immediate context. Because again, I don't have to leave Romans chapter two to make my argument. I can stay right there in Romans chapter two, because again, it's in Romans chapter two, 14 through 15, where Paul describes the works of the law that are written inside the hearts of the Gentiles. Go a few verses more up. Verse 21 through 22 in the same chapter. The apostle said, mentioned steal. Why do you steal? Paul said, he mentioned adultery. Why do you commit adultery? He says, you who abhor idols, why do you commit sacrilege? What do you think Paul's referring to there? When Paul mentions steal, what do you think he's doing? He's mentioning one of the Ten Commandments. That's the Eighth Commandment. When Paul mentions adultery, he's referring to the Seventh Commandment. When Paul refers to um, abhorring idols and committing sacrilege, he's referring to the Second Commandment. So again, remember the context of Romans chapter 2. All of Romans chapter two, Paul is simply giving a reminder. The law was never given to the Gentiles. It was given to the the Israelites, to the Jews. Yet the Jews were guilty of hypocrisy, but the Gentiles who were never given the law by nature do what the law requires because it is written on their hearts. So again, the 10 commandments were given to the Israelites. Nonetheless, everybody can say they have the t- a knowledge of the Ten Commandments because, again, the Gentiles, it was written on their heart. It was intrinsically recessed. And again, that law that was written on their hearts refers to the moral law. Paul gives us the example in Romans 2, 21 through 22, when he mentions, you know, why he mentioned steal. Why do you steal? He mentioned adultery. Why do you commit adultery? He says, what well, you who have poor idols, why do you commit sacrilege? So again, You don't have to leave Romans 2 to see how the context refutes the antinomian notions that exist today. Additionally, today there are many people who believe that the moral law was abrogated. Well, if the moral law was abrogated, then we should never expect to see Paul teach on the Ten Commandments now, should we? But guess what we see in the New Testament? Paul teaching on the Ten Commandments. For example, if you look at Ephesians 6, 1 through 2, what does Paul say? Children, obey your parents, for this is right. Honor your mother and father. Hmm, what commandment is honor your mother and father? What might he be referring to? Of course, it's the Ten Commandments. That's what he's referring to. Now, you have to know something about dealing with antinomians, and you'll know who they are, and here's why. Even though I give my disclaimer that the law can't save, the law doesn't provide assurance that the saints of God are not under the law, they're under grace, that we're not married to Moses, we're married to the master Christ Jesus. And I argue that we can't quantify our law keeping and that we do not stop sinning. I can provide those disclaimers all day long. But yet I also stick with the context how the Bible says that the, a law is good if a man uses it lawfully. So once I explain this, like I've been doing throughout the sermon, you know how you know who the antinomians are? Because they're gonna immediately accuse you. Because they hate any reference to the 10 commandments mentioned in the New Testament, they're gonna accuse you. Oh, you believe the law could save. You believe the law provides you with assurance. You believe you're under the law and not grace. You believe you're married to Moses and not to Christ. That's what they're gonna do. And you know why they do those things? It's because they're antinomians. They're anti-law. Therefore, bearing a false witness, according to them, doesn't apply because they believe it's been abrogated. How convenient that they love to slander today because, again, that's what their worldview supports, especially if they believe that the Ten Commandments were abrogated. Additionally, be mindful, I provided my disclaimers on the law, but again, I'm trying to explain the law lawfully. Clearly, Christ had no problem mentioning the law of Moses. What took place with Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew when he was interacting with the devil? 
What did he tell the devil? Worship God and him only shall you serve. Guess what he was referring to? The law of Moses. So again, you see, the, the Bible clearly shows in the New Testament that Christ and Paul taught on the Ten Commandments. It has nothing to do with salvation or assurance, but it just simply has to do with teaching it lawfully. Since, again, Romans 7, 7, Paul mentions, thou shalt not covet the Ten Commandments. Again, another argument that most antinomians are going to go to is they're going to appeal to a notable text, 1 Timothy 1, 9. And they're going to twist it, and they're going to argue, see, 1 Timothy 1, 9 says that the law was not made for a righteous man, therefore the law serves no purpose for Christians. But that's ridiculous. First of all, the law says... The Bible says the law was not made for a righteous man. It doesn't say that the law has no purpose. Again, if people argue that it says it has no purpose, tell them you're simply importing your words into the text that it clearly doesn't say. Now let's talk about the context of 1 Timothy 1. Per the context, clearly, Paul is against men that treat the law recklessly. Clearly, Paul is against those who believe that the law could save. Paul was clearly against that. But Paul is also clearly against those who believe they have a license to live as godless as they want. But what's notable about 1 Timothy 1, 9 is the verse that precedes it. In 1 Timothy 1, 8, Paul said, The law is good if a man uses it lawfully. So I argue the antinomian doesn't treat the text lawfully. They abuse it because they argue that 1 Timothy 1.9 proves that the law serves no purpose. And, and they argue Paul's not teaching the Ten Commandments in 1 Timothy 1. And I argue, oh, yes, he is. <laughs> yes, he is. 1 Timothy 1.9 through 10, Paul literally teaches the fifth commandment, the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the eighth commandment, and the ninth commandment in that order. He literally does. Pay attention to 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. Again, the antinomian argues, Paul doesn't teach on the 10 commandments in the New Testament. Oh, yes, he does. In 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, the Bible says, the law was not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly sinners. It says the unholy, the profane, the murderers of mothers and fathers, manslayers, whoremongers, men stealers, liars and perjurers. Now listen to the Ten Commandments that are mentioned in there. Remember when he mentioned mother and father? That's your fifth commandment. Guess what he said next after that? He said, man slayers. There's your sixth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Then he said, whoremongers. That's adultery. That's your seventh commandment. Then Paul said, liars and perjurers. That right there is your eighth commandment. Or I'm sorry. Then he said, man stealers. And then after that, he said, liars and perjurers. So that's your ninth commandment. So again, let me repeat again. In 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, he mentioned mother and father, that's your fifth commandment. Manslayers, sixth commandment. Then he talked about man, um, whoremongers, seventh commandment. Then he said man stealers, eighth commandment. Then he says liars and perjurers, ninth commandment. So again, Paul mentions the fifth commandment, the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the eighth commandment, and the ninth commandment. No matter how hard people will try, they just can't get away from these facts that are clearly taught in the Bible. If you want more exegesis on 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10, I'd encourage you to read a few theologians. And while I disagree with, with many things these people write, they're pretty decent in 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. You want to read... Leah, um, you want to read um, Earl and Griffin. They got some decent stuff on 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. What I want to do is take us now to the next few verses. I've covered 
um, verse 7 through 8. Now, let me mention something about verse 7 through 8 really quickly here. If you notice something about verse 7, it mentions covet. But then in verse 8, it also says concupiscence. Now, when you're reading these two words, they're very similar in the Greek. But I was reading a Greek lexicon, and I can't remember the name of it. What I'll do is when I post the sermon on YouTube, I'll cite the reference under the bottom of the YouTube video so that way you see it. But when you take a look at covet and concupiscence, it basically means, according to this lexicon I was reading, a strong desire for something or a lust. Now, the reason why this is important, because in verse 8 of Romans 7, notice how Paul mentions that which was wrought in me. The fact that it was wrought in him says something, because wrought in me, according to a Greek grammarian by the name of Robertson, he argued that it literally means the command to lust made him even want to lust even more. So again, this is Paul describing his experience with the law pre-conversion. What I want to do now is draw your attention to the next few verses, verse 9 through 11. Please look at verse 9 through 11 with me, please. Verse 9 says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Verse 10, And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Verse 11, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. In verse 9, notice how Paul says, For I was alive without the law once. Now basically what Paul is explaining here is that there was once a time that he was ignorant, so to speak, of the law. And this is evident by the fact that Paul once believed that his righteousness was blameless. For example, if you look at Philippians chapter 3, remember when the apostle said, if anyone has confidence in the flesh, I have more? Paul said, I was circumcised on the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, a persecutor of the church, and touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So again, Paul was once ignorant of the law, but according to the text that we just read, Paul said God revived him. Now, this is an important word when he says God revived. Actually, this word is very similar to another Greek word that's used in the parable of the prodigal son. Remember when the son went away, <coughs> squandered all of his living, and then realized the pigs ate better than him, and he went back to his father? And remember when it was said that your brother was dead, but now is alive? He was lost, now he's found. When the Bible says that he is now alive, that literally is very similar to what is being explained here by Paul in verse nine, when he says he was revived. So basically, once God opened Paul's eyes to see the nature of the law, Paul realized that he was a sinner deserving of death. Look at verse 10 with me, please. Look at verse 10. It says, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Now, the reason why he's found it to be unto death, remember what I've shared in many sermons. The law reflects God's character, literally. So if the law reflects God's character, then you can rest assured that the obedience to that law must be perfect. Because God's law demands perfection. And therefore, the penalty for disobedience results in death, judgment, and condemnation. But thank God that the apostle believed that the vicarious law-keeping and the particular death of Christ was 
the whole work of his righteousness that was imputed to Paul. Praise God that Paul believed that Christ is his righteousness. And therefore, Paul didn't have to look to himself because he knew all his best deeds and all his righteousness were filthy rags, but he trusted solely in the merits of Christ alone. Now here's what's unique about verse 11. Look what he says in verse 11 about being deceived. In verse 11, he says, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Now this is a lot of humility for Paul. He's claiming that one time he was once deceived. I believe that God's people have gone through a time before their conversion where they were deceived and they embraced a works righteousness or they held to self-righteousness or they uh, believed in dead works. They were lost. Like Paul, he was once a Pharisee. And, but what's unique about Paul is Paul is willing to admit this. He's humble. There's a lot of people today when they're confronted with the truth that their works righteousness, their self-righteousness, their dead works leads to death. They buckle down, so to speak. They become offended. And, they, you know, typically what you'll typically hear is this, particularly from the Lordship guys. They'll argue, well, I spend all this money on all these books. I've been to all these conferences. I made all these friends. And you're telling me now that all that I've learned over the past 10, 15, 20, or 30 years has been wrong. And I say, man, if only you had that same affinity for the things of God as opposed to your friendships with carnal men, you might be in a better position right now. Because I always warn them, who cares about all the books you bought and all the friendships you developed? Paul said he counted all those things of a loss and counted them but dumb. And that's sadly today that most people won't do that. Literally, the apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter three, I count all things of a loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, by whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them but dung that I may win Christ that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And this is why I've long argued. You have to get away from this dead works, this self-righteousness, this works righteousness, and focus solely on the righteousness of Christ. Otherwise, you're going to be deceived. You're going to be deluded. You're simply going to be just somebody who just who cares more about friendships than you do than the gospel. And what's the dangers of that? What did the Apostle Paul say? After Paul warned that if you preach any other gospel than what, what, than what he preached, then let him be anathema. Paul said, do I seek to please men or do I seek to please God? For if I sought to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. <clears throat> In Paul's writings, he provided us with another reason why we don't treat the law of God insolently. While we despise legalism, we should equally loathe antinomianism also. Because again, while the law can never save, the law can never provide assurance, God's elect are not under the law, but under grace. God's elect are not married to Moses. We're married to the master Christ Jesus. We don't look to the law for anything salvific wise because we don't mix law and gospel. But the Bible is very clear that the law is good if it is used lawfully. So let's see a lawful way how Paul treats the law. Take a look at verse 12, please. Paul says, verse 12, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Pause here for a moment. Regarding this text, Paul clearly understood the law. 
This is a fantastic reason why we treat the law with care. We don't mix law and gospel, but we treat it lawfully. Paul here is explaining something that every Christian needs to know. First of all, understand this about the moral law of God. And this is important. When you hear terms like good, holy, and just, where do they derive from? So if you hear someone say that they're good or that they're holy, ask them, by what standard are you good and are you holy and just? By what standard? Because according to the Bible, which is the ultimate standard of all standard, it says there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who does good. All your righteousness are filthy rags. So again, you have to ask them by what standard. So bottom line, what is I'm arguing is that holy, just, and good exists outside of man, but it does not exist outside of God. That's important. What Paul is basically explaining here is a lawful way of understanding the law. Because notice again earlier, he already mentioned, thou shall not covet. So clearly the context, he uh, clearly alluded to or cited the 10th commandment. And now he's saying that the commandments are good, just, and holy. Again, good, just, and holy reflect God's character. God's word is explicit about that. For example, in Psalm 119, 137, the Bible says, Thou art righteous, O Lord, and upright are your works. Thou art righteous, O Lord, and upright are your works. So again, God is righteous. Psalm 25, verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. He will teach sinners in the way. Thus far, I've already covered that God is righteous. Now I've covered that God is good. Because again, good and righteousness reflect his character. That's why we don't treat the law insolently. Additionally, what about holiness? Isaiah 6.3. The angels cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So God is righteous. God is good. God is holy because they reflect his character. Zephaniah 3.5. If you pay careful attention to Zephaniah 3.5, it literally says the just Lord is in the mix. In the midst. He will do no iniquity. The just Lord is in the midst. And then of course, Mark 10.18. Mark 10. Mark 10 verse 18 says, why do you call me good? None is good but one, that is God. So I've established already that when Paul mentions in this text that the commandments are good, just, and holy, clearly the context, he already mentioned, thou shall not covet the 10th commandment. And in that same context, just a few verses later, he says the commandments are just, good, and holy. And again, they reflect his nature because God is holy. God is good. God is just. No created human being could ever say those things unless they have the righteousness of Christ imputed to them. But they can only say those things, but they have to make sure they give a disclaimer. It's only by imputation because there is nothing inherently in any created being that is good, holy, or just. Again, they reflect God's character. So it's imperative that you understand that. And if you want more information on understanding a, a proper use of the law, and again, I don't agree with everything he writes, but Gentry has a book out there called um, The Law Made Easy. And it's an easy, simple to read guide. Again, <clears throat> you're gonna have to examine it with scripture. I agree with many things he says, but again, like, most authors are not going to agree with everything. Let's move on to the last verse. Look at the last verse with me for today's sermon. Verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, 
worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Again, like we had the very first verse I read in today's sermon. Paul's question answer approach is nothing new. He's helping to clarify his position. He's overcoming possible objections and he's helping Christians to think critically. This is imperative. And the reason why is because, again, when you read the Bible, it can become confusing. On one side, the Bible says that we're dead to the law and we're freed from the law. But then a few verses later, Paul says that the law is holy, just, and good. And then he also says later on, I delight in the law. Well, that's important because, first of all, you won't find reprobates saying they delight in the law. No reprobate says things like that. For example, and the reason why, because if you read Romans 8, the Bible says because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, it does not, it's, it, it's not subject to the law of God for a deed. It cannot be. So clearly, only a child of God could say such things like I delight in the law the way Paul said. Because Paul understood the law. So bottom line is Paul's basically pointing out, look, The law is not sinful. Men are sinful. The law is not evil. Men are evil. The law is not the fault for the penalty of death. It's men's transgressions. Remember what the Bible says. Whoever committeth sin transgresseth the law because sin is a transgression of the law. And again, when the Bible mentions delivered from the law, freed from the law, you shall not serve the law. The Bible is simply pointing out that Christ redeemed us from the curse and the bondage thereof. But again, other texts where Paul says the law is holy, just, and good, and he delighted in it, if you understand a proper use of the law, then you won't fall into legalism and you definitely won't fall into antinomianism. You'll fall into a biblical understanding. With that stated, praise God that the apostle believed that the vicarious law-keeping of Christ and his particular death is the whole work of God's righteousness and its compact unity that was imputed to him. And every one of God's people can say the same thing. And if you agree with that, then you can certainly agree with what the, the Bible says in Isaiah 61 verse 10. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God because he has covered me with the garments of salvation and he has clothed me in the robe of righteousness. I pray you believe that. Now with that stated, let's uh, conclude And I pray by God's grace that you'll join me next week as I will preach our final sermon, Lord willing, in Romans chapter 7. And I pray you can uh, join me by God's grace so we can continue to study God's word together and grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray and then we'll sing the Psalms. Christ, I pray that you receive all the glory today. I'm thankful, Lord, that the apostle testified about the oracles of God, about the imputation of your righteousness, and about a proper understanding of the law. I pray, Lord, today that we will avoid the the temptations and the evils of legalism and antinomianism. And I pray, Lord, that we will understand the law lawfully and biblically. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.